For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Hello and welcome to Strat News Global. Earlier this week, I anchored a program and moderated the discussion at the Global Technology Summit hosted by Carnegie India in association with the Ministry of External Affairs on the future roadmap for India-US technology cooperation under the umbrella of what is called ICET or Initiative for Critical and Emerging Technologies. This was a 45 minute long session with experts and uh, knowledgeable people on both sides, India and US. And uh, that's why I thought for this week's edition of Simply Nitin, we must play that for the benefit of our viewers. So take a listen. I'm Nitin Gokhale. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thankfully, Nivrutti took, uh, took this session in between lunch and our session. So I think people are already awake uh, with a uh, detailed and um, insightful analysis of what AI is all about. So my task has been made easier. Uh, so wonderful to have uh, all of you here. And of course, uh, thank you, uh, Carnegie India, for having me to do this, uh, moderating this session. So uh, looking at uh, ISET, which was uh, initiated uh, as a concept in May 2022, and then of course uh, launched in January earlier this year, uh, less than uh, a year ago. And of course, uh, the momentum that it has generated uh, with top level uh, meetings, both in India and in uh, uh, US or in Washington DC, uh, frequent government interactions, uh, which has uh, promoted uh, the emerging and critical technologies, so the question that uh, I'm going to pose to my uh, fellow panelists here uh, are uh, twofold. One, of course, where we are uh, at the moment, uh, one year, uh, nearly one year after the launch of uh, the initiative, and uh, where we are going, where we are headed, what is needed to uh, make this uh, a program that can be uh, implemented uh, at a faster pace than before, and uh, what are the... Uh, facilitations that are required both from the governments and the private sector and what drives it is what uh, we're going to do. So let me start with uh, Tarun uh, Chabra uh, asking you whether uh, the motivation behind ISET to begin with, uh, is it uh, the technology partnership with India in the emerging domain? Uh, what made both the governments uh, buy into it really? Uh, and then uh, backing it uh, so strongly, uh, as we see it, there has been no let up in the momentum. So uh, give us a sense of uh, how the uh, two governments look at it and what drives the initiative at the moment as we see it. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I, I think um, the idea was that we, we had opportune timing. In both countries, I think there was an opportunity to really focus um, uh, strategic technology cooperation at the center of the bilateral relationship, and not only to deepen cooperation bilaterally, but also to use it as a platform to deepen cooperation more broadly as well. And so what we've tried to do, I think, with ISAT is to, you know, in some cases, um, open doors that were slightly ajar. Uh, in some cases, hopefully notice that the door is not fully locked, actually. And in some cases, cut into a wall, right? And, 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 and I think um, uh, over the last year, we've actually been able to deliver some very significant results, and uh, particularly with the state visit uh, of, the, of the PM uh, to Washington in June, um, whether you're looking at the co-production deal with the GE engine, uh, whether you're looking at uh, cooperation in space, uh, much of which will uh, unfold this year with a joint mission between NASA and ISRO, um, um, ensuring that uh, we have the successful launch of the NISAR satellite as well. Um, and then the significant um, uh, investment of Micron um, in, in the Indian semiconductor uh, ecosystem as well. But alongside all of that, I think it really has enabled deeper strategic cooperation. You saw that when one of my bosses, John Feiner, was here just the other day and had the opportunity to talk not only about ISAT, but about broader regional issues and many other strategic issues as well. That's, that's a great um, overview of the uh, initiative, really. 
but uh, let me turn to Chantal for uh, where we are uh, at the moment. You have worked in the government earlier and now you are in the private sector. Uh, also looking at the government affairs in LAM research. And uh, the announcement, of course, in June was about, uh, you know, uh, the skilling initiative that LAM had done. Give us a sense of where we are uh, since that announcement and uh, is it moving fast enough or you need the speed to be uh, then, you know, a little more than what it is right now? And how the two governments are really pushing it? What is your sense in that? Okay, that's a multi-pronged question, but I think... <laughs> I can answer it. So coming from my perspective, having spent a lot of time in the government and having, you know, 15 plus years of actually working on a lot of these bilateral technology partnerships that involved working with governments like India on reducing trade barriers and then establishing different levels and types of technology cooperation and collaboration, I have to say the ISET has been sort of a stunning mechanism because of the structure of it. Not only is it sort of um, whole of government, but it is a top-down approach. It has the attention of the leadership of both governments sort of propelling action and propelling it forward. I think that it is more than a mechanism that um, you know, meets once a year it is constant communication on different levels, bringing in multi-agencies, multi-stakeholders, including industry, which is pivotal to a lot of these technological uh, collaborations and cooperation. Um, and from our personal perspective at LAM, with the commitment made in the joint statement, you see that statement came out in June. Our first pilot program at ISC was in September. And a lot of that was um, propelled forward by the both governments, but the government of India really sort of moving it forward and um, understanding that that was something that they wanted to happen. And so September, the pilot program started, and there's another semester starting in January. So that will continue to roll out. It will continue to move as fast as it has. Um, and, you know, the program will, will go forward over the next few years. So... I'm very proud of it. I think that you know the ISET has been one of the way, one of the great sort of uh, creating that momentum to make things move fast. That's a, a great cue for me to uh, turn to Nivruti and ask. Uh, you know, she's spoken about and Tarun has spoken about how two governments are really uh, have bought into this program and are really pushing it hard at the highest level. Uh, that is the difference uh, in the earlier programs like uh, Chantal mentioned uh, than what we have right now. What role does Invest India see for itself uh, in facilitating uh, private sector participation or investment from deep tech companies uh, either in Europe or US uh, wherever and then joining them up with uh, the initiative that has been launched by both the governments. Uh, I think Invest India role that you just mentioned perhaps plays into this uh, entire system, uh, or uh, how do you see that really? Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I spoke so much about AI, so I'm going to keep out of that. But uh, the role Invest India plays with ISET. Um, so first of all, just to add to what Tarun said, I really think the relationship between India and US has never been sweeter. And it comes with the selfish interest of the two countries and the world. The selfish interest is we need to drive security, safety, privacy, growth in a democratic way. And these two countries are very natural partners. When I look at US, so I told you in India is synonymous to software, India is synonymous to population data, India is also synonymous to scaling solutions. Now US is synonymous to Technology, U.S. is synonymous to inventions, innovations, and U.S. is synonymous to quality of life through capital. So to me, these two coming together is nothing better for the world. And the role in West India plays, and by the way, it was not accidental for me to get into Invest India. It was a conscious effort to bring a private sector, to bring a technologist 
into this role because India knows that India is going to catapult into growth through technology. In no way am I saying that India doesn't have its issues, its challenges, but that's where United States steps in. So my role is to look at, and by the way, I honestly, and there's so many government folks here, they may like it, they may not like it, but I honestly feel government is an enabler. The investor, the doer, is either private sector or academicians or research organizations. So what my role is, because I'm half government, I am able to listen to the private sector, their needs. Actually, I was talking to Chantal, and when we went to meet LAM, I actually learned so much about LAM, thinking of myself as an extension of her team. And then I realized what are some of the gaps that LAM has that India or Indian companies or Indian government could you know, fill in. So my role is, look at the SWOT of not just the countries, but the companies and match strengths to weaknesses, opportunity to opportunity and threat, join hands. So that's what I feel my role is, either for investment perspective or trade or even R&D. In my recent trip to US, and like I said, you know, 30 years with Intel, I know cloud, I know 5G, I know compute. I went to Argan National Lab. I looked at the cutting edge research that they're doing besides, you know, the exascale compute, which Intel was building for them. We have looked at opportunities to sign up for R&D. So EV is important for India. Lithium ion research is cutting edge there. That's perhaps an R&D partnership. So Invest India is going to look at what are some of the strength, weakness, opportunity, threat of countries and companies against India, and what can India give and take? I met many of my African friends. I really think there's a lot of partnership between Africa and India. There's a lot of partnership. And our goal is to enable this with a bigger intention of driving growth for the world through investment, trade, and technology. That's what you know, Invest India will do. I think, uh, yes, well elaborated there. So before I come to Arun, I think, uh, let me uh, turn to Vivek. Uh, and uh, Vivek, you've uh, been uh, uh, coming to India first as a defense industry uh, leader uh, for a long time and uh, of course still with the uh, defense uh, innovator or a leading defense firm in the uh, US which has now got a, a big partnership coming up with India. Uh, General Atomics uh, is uh, likely to get this uh, order going for forward the Predators or the Sea Guardians. Now. Uh, one of the key issues here is how much of the technology that you have can be uh, transferred uh, to entities in India or uh, can uh, IndusX, which is uh, also another initiative which was parallelly launched in June uh, in the US and uh, several other follow-ups are happening, can be part of that kind of a process where companies like yours can play a role. How do you see that? Yeah, thanks, Nitin. Um I think the, both the governments need to be given a lot of credit. Um, Tarun is very humble, but his outstanding leadership on this, on ISET, and the ability of both leaderships at the president and prime minister level, but also the NSA levels, has resulted in great momentum. And I mean, I've been observing the US-India relationship for a long time, but kind of the excitement that this has brewed over the last uh, year or so is, is just, very different. And so we have to really capture the moment. And as General Atomics, one of the things that we are very proud of is that we are an early pioneer in this ISET um, initiative. Uh, we have partnered with 114 AI and Third Eye Tech. These are two um, companies, one in artificial intelligence and one in semiconductors. And I can see Vinayak there and Rinda they have excellent uh, uh, companies that we have not only partnered with, and you know we, we talk about manufacturing and services and all that, but we have partnered from a joint technology development perspective. And so we actually have a joint product that we have come up with. So within months of ISET being launched, there's a real success to point to. And I think there will be more of that happening. And I think that is what is gonna fuel the next uh, wave of more successes is if we do have early successes like this and partnerships like this. So 
Um, whether we are talking about multi-domain uh, awareness due to AI tools, or we are talking about uh, you know missile systems and seekers and other things that we can jointly do, it's these are very tangible and important stepping stones for this program or other initiatives to continue, and and we are very proud of that fact. I think the stakeholders, of course, are the you know as we talked about, is the government to government piece. But also, I think the business to business, the um, communications and media is a very important aspect of it. I think industry leaders, um, not only the large industry, but the small, medium, and startup industry have a large role to play here. Um, I do also think the academia and the think tanks, and, and great credit goes to Carnegie India and the Ministry of External Affairs to, to put this all together because Part of it is perception and putting the messaging out of and showcasing the successes um, because that will fuel more interest. And as uh, has been explained, we, we want to create an entire ecosystem that propels it forward. Um, the one thing I would also like to add here is the Quad Initiative and the Quad um, Investment Network. Again, uh, we had a very successful meeting in the White House a few weeks ago and uh, um, you know, Tarun and uh, Secretary Romando and uh, Carl Mehta and others, they, they're spearheading, I guess, a framework between four countries. Again, with critical and emerging technologies at the heart um, and the implementation partners are at the table too, in other words, businesses who can take this forward. I think that's yet another very important uh, mechanism um, to propel ISET, Indusex, and all these initiatives in the right direction. Yes, that's right. Arun, uh, you've seen this from a vantage point. Uh, some years ago, defense used to be the front and center of the India-US relationship. Now it seems uh, that has been replaced by ISET. What is the difference between what was in defense uh, relationship and uh, why is ISET uh, gaining this traction or has gained this traction uh, so fast? Uh, what is the difference in implementation or in the way that has been conceived? So, Nitin, I think ICET uh, marks the next major transformative phase in the India-US relationship. And the initiative really caught the wave. And I think it's perhaps as transformative as the civil nuclear cooperation agreement that was done in 2008. Following that agreement, there's not been any nuclear commerce between the two countries, but started the process of dismantling technology-related restrictions uh, uh, from US uh, for India. Uh, before the nuclear deal, we hardly bought any defense supplies from the US. And as uh, Vivek has also mentioned, by now we've contracted to buy more than $23 billion worth of defense supplies. Uh, you are also looking at defense technology partnerships. So all this would not have happened. Now, with the defense, uh, with the technology uh, releases starting at that time, uh, both governments had set up the High Technology Cooperation Group uh, to look at technology restrictions that they were there and allow for case-by-case -case approvals when the blocks were coming up. Over time, they found that the HTCG was hardly blocking any suppliers because the level of technology for which it had been set up, uh, those releases were happening. Now, there was a sense that there is growing convergence, strategic convergence between India and the US, not quite yet backed up by the same convergence in terms of economic and technological partnership. Uh, the India-US trade is about $200 billion. US-China trade is $750 billion. Of course, the India-US trade itself has increased 15 times in the last 20 years, but still much more uh, can be done. So given that, uh, as I understand it, there was a thought about what kind of steps you could take to deepen the economic partnership, to deepen technology partnership. And one area that emerged was that everybody says that the critical and emerging technologies, AI, quantum, cyber, 6G, biotech, uh, role for private sector in space, semiconductors, they are going to completely transform the way we live and work. And in these areas, everywhere, new work was taking place. So could you look at building a partnership in these areas? so that you then build a partnership between the two countries for the future. So I think that was the thought process. But then the other aspect was that India and the US were not even able to do limited trade agreements.
because every time you tried, there were existing interests on both sides. Who would block it? So is it possible to start ab initio with a technology partnership so that you have ab initio discussions on norms and standards that work for you? Based on technology partnership, then you look at production sharing. Based on production sharing, then you look at what kind of trading arrangement you can use to facilitate this. So for example, if you see in semiconductors following ISET, uh, major investments have been announced. Work is happening. And then the Commerce Ministry of India and Department of Commerce have worked out an MOU on semiconductors to see how this can be facilitated. So that was the idea. And I think what has happened now is that earlier uh, both sides looked at cooperation in science uh, for the sake of science with diplomatic spin-offs. But in January, the message has gone from both the countries that from national security perspective, they believe that we should have a technology partnership in the critical and emerging areas. So I think it has changed uh, the framework for the relationship. It has sent a message, including to bureaucracies in both governments. You know, I used to find in the US when I was working there, that even though there was a message from the White House or message from the uh, Defense uh, Secretary of Defense that we want high-level cooperation, when you go to mid-level bureaucracy, uh, the proposals would stall because they'd say, is India really that kind of a partner? <coughs> Uh, can we release this kind of technology? And I think now the message is going that we see India as that kind of partner. So I think that's the change that's happening. Thank you. I know Chantel has to uh, leave for a very important appointment. So one quick question, uh, if, uh, if you can answer. Uh, since you are now working with private sector for upskilling and in, in India, do you see enough potential in India for having enough people to uh, sort of meet that requirement? Uh, you're talking about 60,000 people initially to be trained. So uh, how do you see that future or that roadmap? So on the workforce development piece, you know, when you look at the semiconductor industry, that is consistently one of the issues that comes up, right? And it's not, it's, it's everywhere. Everywhere where you see semiconductor production in a semiconductor ecosystem is talent and the competition for qualified talent. And Definitely India has one of its great skills is having the, the workforce available, skilled labor, skilled workforce. Um, as the semiconductor ecosystem grows and develops in India, the need for that workforce will change slightly with different elements of the ecosystem uh, developing at different times. I think that our proposal in terms of what we are doing with the virtual virtualization of some of this training that will work in combination with phys physical nano labs and equipment will help accelerate that. Um, and then that can happen in other places as well. We look at the competition for talent, not just all, all over the world, and how do we accelerate that to look to the future. The industry itself is growing at a massively rapid pace. You look at me trying to meet the demands of 2030, we are going to have to do this faster, accelerate it, be more efficient about it. Um, as the ecosystem de develops in India, those needs will become much more apparent. Um, so I think India can absolutely uh, help fill those gaps as we look towards the future. That's good, That's good to know because uh, it will depend on the human resource quality after all, whatever you are trying to do. But uh, I, I know you have to leave, so I am going to allow you whenever you want to leave uh, and then turn to the other panelists in the meantime. So Tarun, coming back to you, um, the US, uh, India, US and India are also uh, partners in, uh, in the Quad, uh, also I2, U2. Uh, how is that, uh, those groupings uh, going to play into ICET or ICET going to play into those groupings? Do you see uh, some kind of synergies there? Do you see some kind of partnerships developing uh, in that framework also? No, and, and um, look, I do want to really underscore, I think, a point that both Navruti and Chantal made, which is, I think we're now hitting kind of um, escape velocity where um, we provided enough of a catalyst where I think now people see this as a platform that they can take advantage of. And we hope that it becomes a mechanism where um, all of you are putting pressure on us to ask, um, you know, why aren't we doing more? Um, we're bringing things to the table now on the platform. 
open the doors for us, right? And that's that's where I hope we're getting now. I, I very much agree uh, on the quad. I mean, by design, I think the idea is that we have some degree of interoperability and the platforms are complementary. I think a good example um, is the work of our National Science Foundation where we have a number of MOUs here um, that have, whether it's on AI or biotechnology, um, and we're doing kind of complementary work in the quad that gives broader reach, more opportunity for investment. I think the Quad Investors Network is another is another good example of that, um, which was just mentioned by Vivek, where you know whether it's uh, telecom or other areas, um, bringing the Quad Investors Network may provide opportunities for investment in India, but also uh, outward investment um, in taking Indian products abroad uh, into third countries as well. That, that's, I think, the key, uh, that widening the net would be probably the key going forward. But Arun, let me come back to you. Uh, we just had uh, this uh, meeting between um, uh, uh, Tarun's boss uh, and uh, Deputy National Security Advisor on the Indian side, Vikram Misri, uh, Fine Arun Misri had a meeting where they decided to widen the uh, scope of ISET by including some new verticals or new technologies. Uh, there's some questions around it uh, that uh, are we, uh, is there a, a kind of a broadening of this agenda? Would it dilute the focus? Would it uh, sort of uh, effectiveness uh, can get reduced? How would you see that uh, decision or that questions that are around this uh, decision? So Nitin, looking at it from outside, uh, clearly ICIT has got people's imagination. And I think there is a sense, uh, as I see it in both governments, that if you put it something in the framework of ICET, uh, it focuses attention and approvals are faster. You know, the G414 uh, technology approval, I don't think would have happened without ICET. Uh, the semiconductor investments that have taken place would not have happened without ICET. Uh, if you look at what's been agreed to in space, for example, um, uh, Nisar, uh, the uh, joint India-US mission to the International Space Station uh, next year, U.S. training uh, the Indian astronaut. And uh, additionally, as you know, now there's increasing strength in India in private sector in space. Earlier it was concentrated in the government. And so now bringing U.S. and Indian private sector together for collaboration related uh, to, uh, to space, India joining also the uh, Artemis uh, Accords. And the U.S. saying that in their commercial lunar space program, they will in involve Indian companies. So all this would not have been possible. So at one level in many areas, uh, semiconductors, uh, space, uh, defense, in defense, uh, the Indusex framework for collaboration uh, in defense technology, collaboration of startups has picked up steam. Now in some areas, progress perhaps has not been uh, as much as in these areas. I think in artificial intelligence, for example, we are not yet hearing uh, specifically what has been agreed to perhaps after all the discussions here, maybe, uh, uh, at the next big meeting, something concrete will be announced. Uh, we have not seen anything specific so far in quantum, uh, in uh, telecom. So maybe that's something they could work on. But I think the reason why additional areas are coming in uh, clearly is a signal, as I say, it, that both governments attach importance to that, or whichever government is proposing attaches importance to that area, and are hoping that placing it in the ICET framework will focus attention and get approvals that are required. And again, as part of ICET, as you know, earlier I had spoken about the High Technology Cooperation Group, which had men uh, rendered itself irrelevant. But the two governments have now set up the strategic trade dialogue. And, um, and uh, earlier it was the Indian Foreign Secretary with the counterpart in Department of Commerce. Now it's the Indian Foreign Secretary with the joint uh, counterpart from the Department of Commerce and Department of State, with Department of Defense present. Again, showing from the U.S. side what is the importance being attached. And the whole purpose of the strategic trade dialogue, which has met, and the intercessional, I understand, is tomorrow, is to enable uh, uh, sort of approvals for technologies that will come under the framework of ICED. So I would be eclectic. I think whatever enables um, higher level of cooperation across the, whatever breadth is possible should certainly be attempted. That's encouraging to know. In fact, uh, Niruti, uh, some of the areas that Invest India has worked uh, all these years are, of course, something that uh, the organization knows very well. But some areas like uh, treating or uh, doing critical mineral uh, and rare earths processing technologies, 
could be uh, something that uh, would be future requirements for India. Are you uh, able to visualize uh, some companies or identify some companies or some startups in India for this kind of uh, work that might may be required as part of ICET going forward? Oh, absolutely. Um, firstly, you know, as part of ICET, whatever gets into, so whether it's expansion of it, I'm actually happy about it. Because what happens is the minute the technology is listed in ICET, there are those smart minds all around the world who are, you know, entrepreneurial, want to invest in it. There are technologists in academia who want to work, work on it. So entrepreneurs, technologists, and then, you know, the focus of the government, so investment, all of that happens. As in West India, you know, what comes naturally to me is definitely semiconductors and technology. So I force myself to think other things because I don't want to, you know, neglect things which are also important. So I can tell you that, you know, when I think of quad, uh, I think of Australia, I think of minerals. Believe me, there are startups who are doing amazing work. India is best to itch its own itch. So, you know, I often say if data was food, nobody's going hungry in India because we consume so much of it. Um, there are uh, startups who are looking at alternate to lithium to build EV batteries. There are startups who know that India is the fourth largest automotive market, but most of the cars are, uh, you know, like the Suzuki is really small. So they are looking at alternate solutions, working with, uh, you know, other minerals, other technologies, but also power electronics to come up with 30% addition to the capacity of the range of batteries. I also want to tell you in terms of food processing, Saudi Arabia is very interested in partnering with us. When it comes to, you know, furniture, Australia is very in uh, interested and also with minerals. When it comes to organic textiles, US is very excited about it. So we are working with many such companies, just to name one. Eileen Fisher is not a very popular brand in India, but it works on its sustainability is key. Organic fabric is key, organic dyeing is key. So we are actually figuring out 95% of handloom fabric is made in India. So I'm looking at who are the ones that need us. So besides looking at technology, which comes natural to me, I'm looking at minerals. I'm looking at partnership. You know, Africa has minerals. What does Africa need that we have? Our, our governance services, you know, all of the jam trinity based opportunities. So we are looking at, like I said, you know, the best thing for me, very structured way of engaging with countries and companies is a simple SWOT. Okay. Here is what I can offer. Here's my weakness. Yeah. Here is what you can offer mm -hmm. to me. So those are the ways I'm looking at it. Great. Uh, before I uh, go to uh, Vivek and then open it up to the audience, uh, Tarun, one uh, quick question, uh, which uh, may be uh, sort of uh, a year away, but uh, or maybe six months away, change in political establishment in either country, uh, could it change the pace, could it slow down the pace of ICET implementation? I, I, I think there's a lot of uh, ballast in the relationship. Um, you know, when I, when in, at least in the areas that I work on, uh, China technology issues and our partnership with India, I think there's a lot of bipartisan support um, for for all of it. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to predict <laughs> um, uh, some of these some of these dynamics, but but I do think there'll be there'll be you know a bulwark for support. Vivek, uh, General Atomics, of course, is well known for its uh, UAVs, armed UAVs and others. But you also work in other sectors like nuclear uh, and others. Uh, what are the prospects for uh, some of those technologies uh, coming under uh, the ICET framework? Or at least you offering them for Indian startups or Indian uh, joint ventures here or even transferring some of it here? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. You know, we are in areas like nuclear fusion, nuclear fission, electromagnetic launch and recovery systems, satellites. Um, so there's there's a whole uh, host of technology areas that I think could be suitable for the Indian market. I think two things since we're sitting at a global technology summit. As you look at the global landscape, uh, two things are very important. One is, can you do innovation at the price point required to be competitive? And the second piece is, do you have the right human resources to actually put to the task? And I would say a, a third piece is, are there is there competition out there 
that's trying to leapfrog every technology we are talking about in this summit, for example. And so as we keep all those three things in mind, I think US and India provide a very good complementary role. Um, I talked about the Indian startup ecosystem. I mean, the technology is coming out of India at the price point that they come out is, is quite stunning. And so it makes a lot of sense for us to synergize, whether it, we're talking about uh, energy security or um, defense security. But I think we're um, on the right path. And I think there'll be more areas uh, that I talked about where we can make progress. So I will open up for the audience here. Uh, and uh, of course, please identify yourself a quick question and um, uh, uh, just identify the person you want uh, the answer from. So if I can have uh, a quick question from you here and then maybe look at another option. To Mr. Tarun Chawada. Please identify yourself. Yeah, Sarjit Dudeja. Mm -hmm. so here we are talking about ISAT including semiconductor, quantum and other things. My question is regarding our health science where we need genetic engineering, gen genome mapping or precision medicine. Do you have this type of understanding between India and US? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so so um, one of the questions that you asked, uh, I did ask. <laughs> Aaron, was actually about new areas, and biotechnology is definitely one of those areas. Um, we um, we're actually looking now at what some of those projects could be, and so it's an open field, and we actually welcome all kinds of recommendations. I'd say one area that would naturally be an area for us to work on is at the beginning. Um, uh, of, of the Biden administration, we looked at four particular areas of acute supply chain vulnerability, semiconductors, batteries, minerals, um, and APIs uh, for pharmaceuticals. And I would say we've been able to do quite a bit in the area of semiconductors with the CHIPS Act and the critical uh, minerals with the Inflation Reduction Act, um, and also with batteries, but less on APIs. And I think that's an area where um, we actually could do a lot of good work together. What I'm going to do is to take three questions now, uh, one there, uh, here, and then uh, Mr. Suri uh, here, and then uh, ask the panelists to answer. Can we have that mic there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Nitin, uh, I'm Pradeep Gupta, OSX, OSD, Indigenization, MOD. Uh, my question is to Tarun. Uh, in this ISET, uh, you have uh, various technologies beside the defense also. Uh, US is having one program of rapid defense experimentation reserve where the the armed forces uh, uh, decide on certain technologies and then they ask the industries. Uh, are one of those uh, uh, proposals being also considered in ISET to be shared with India and the Indian research organizations as well as the industry will be part of the research program there. Manufacturing is one part, but that is happening after a certain stage. Research is more important, especially for defense. And another is that I said, okay, we are talking about big things here at high level, but the required skills, because as uh, uh, OSD indigenization, I had encountered that, I'll not name the company, they came to India as a defense officer and they were scurrying all around that uh, they were telling that uh, the capable skills are not available, whom to give this? That's, that's the question that so, I had asked, that yeah. whether we have the skills, so but yeah, uh, Dan here and then uh, Mr. Nalin Suri. Hi, I wanted to ask uh, Aaron and, and Tarun whether, given the success so far of ISET, whether there's an opportunity to add another pillar to ISET, which would be working with third countries. And if so, what what technology would fit best in that pillar, if, if that's an opportunity? Thank you. My question is to Ambassador Arun Singh. You identified three sectors where you felt adequate progress has not been made, AI, quantum, et cetera. Is there any particular reason for that? Or is this something which will happen automatically? Okay, so over to both of you. Uh, I think uh, Arun and then Tarun. So on uh, Ambassador Nalin Suri's question, uh, no, my sense is that attempts are being made across the board. And in these areas, obviously, some more work is required uh, to understand uh, what the uh, sort of desire is on each side uh, about specific area for cooperation and how to progress on that. So that's what the, as I see it, uh, going through. So I'm confident that it will uh, work itself, uh, way, uh, work its way through that. Uh, yeah, and uh, Dan, on your question, so again, as I understand it now from outside the system, first the attempt was look at the bilateral aspect, 
because you had to get that going. And once that's going, obviously the two countries can look at it, which is the area. Uh, AI could be one area or whatever else, where whatever you built up through bilateral cooperation, you could then take it profitably uh, to other countries. Because, you know, I think both countries have articulated that they uh, see technology as being a force for global good. They see the bilateral relationship being a force for global good. Uh, so, and as there is increasing competition uh, for what is now being described as the global south, I'm sure that opportunity will be there uh, to take some of the outcomes uh, with advantage to other countries. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, I, I agree um, with Arun's point here on third countries. I think already we are thinking about third countries depending on the sector, right? And so I think over the coming year, that's probably something that you'll hear more about, uh, absolutely. On defense, we should hear from Vivek, but I'll just to set him up, I mean, I would say one of the great things about the collaboration between General Atomics and Third Eye Tech um, uh, and 114 AI is, I, is not just meeting needs for the defense industrial base here in India, but also potentially for the United States and for other US partners as well, including very near-term needs. Um, at lower cost and kind of doing that in partnership together. So I think there's actually a lot of potential there. One other uh, collaboration that I think will probably um, grow more in the coming year is with our Defense Innovation Unit and our new director, Doug Beck, who's already been to India and I think is working with a number of, of parties here. Yeah, no, I completely agree with Tarun. I think um, there is just a great amount of potential to have near-term solutions, not only in India, but for the US. And, and Third Eye Tech and 114 AI, they have contracts with, with for example, US Space Force, et cetera. So they, there's, um, it's a two-way street. And I said, as I said in my earlier comments, the doing innovation at the right price point uh, is gonna be very critical in the near term. I think uh, we'll take uh, the last question, perhaps from James, you had a question? Yeah. Yeah, there's a question for all of the panel um, about cloud. Um, within the context of ISET, it wasn't one of the areas that I saw as part of the list of potential areas for collaboration, but I wondered if sort of co-developed cloud offerings was something that might fall within this area um, for future ISET work. And to what extent do, respectively, the government of India and the US view the rise of the Chinese hyperscale cloud providers in South, Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands as a, a, a threat to national security? Tarun and Nevruti both have to answer this. <laughs> yeah. I think it's very important uh, to focus on cloud. And, uh, you know, the few countries that have exascale compute U.S. has more than six, uh, you know, or so exascale compute. Then is Japan, and then and then there is China. India has aspirations to build its own exascale compute, and and therefore cloud and cloud offerings become really really important. Though the focus is there, the other place where I can tell you that cloud is going to be very very critical is in the 5G, 6G space where a lot of disaggregation is happening. You know, previously when we'd had one large solution, now you have CU, DU, RU, like smaller compute. All of them have, you know, a lot of softwareization. All of that softwareization happens, you know, in the cloud. So enabling 5G with cloud native applications, enabling exascale compute to drive AI based applications, to have democratization of compute capacity through cloud is what the government is working for. Just like you know, you have power generation, power transmission that goes into everybody's homes. The goal is to build compute infrastructure where there's compute generation and compute capability that's available to tier two, tier three. So a lot of like hub and spoke kind of model is uh, what we are looking at. You want to add something? Last word to you, Tarun. Yeah, I would just say I think you know the the, the ticker tape for everything we're doing here is really about trusted vendors, trusted geographies. It's something that the external affairs minister has talked about this year and last year um, and many other Indian officials uh, as well. I think there's more that we can do to kind of manifest that, that trust, which is really, I think, growing quite a bit. Um, and as Navruti said, it's really going to be critical to make progress 
on some of our goals in the telecom space, but also on AI, of course. Um, and, and so that's where I think there's a lot more work that we could do in 2024 together. That's a good uh, word to uh, end this session on. I think I'm exactly on time and thanks to my panelists for being very brief and succinct about uh, their replies. Uh, so a round of applause for them, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And I thank you here for your participation too. Thank you very much.